Your brothers and sisters, grace and peace are yours through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Life is full of choices. Some like, would you like fries with that, or lima beans are fairly easy to make. But some can be a little bit trickier. There was once a contest uh, that was run in a national magazine for the best answer to the following question. If you were in the Louvre, the world famous art museum, with many, many priceless pieces of art all around you, and there was a fire and you could grab one painting, which painting would it be? A gentleman by the name of Bernard Tristan won, and this was his reply, the one that was closest to the exit. Some choices are easy, and other ones are not so much. A group of friends went deer hunting, and they paired off two by two, and late one night, uh, Harry came back, struggling with an eight-point buck all by himself, and, and uh, somebody said, well, where's Mike? And he said, well, he's back there a couple of miles back up the trail. He seems to have a stroke or something. And the rest of the group looked at him and said, you left Mike back on the trail with a stroke? He says, yeah, I know it wasn't an easy choice, but I looked at Mike and I looked at the deer and I figured nobody was going to steal Mike. <laughs> Making choices often comes down to what our greatest priorities are. Our gospel lesson today picks up not long after last week's gospel, and Jesus, who was doing a lot of teaching and laying out some very difficult teaching about a vineyard and, and, and caring for things, and, and it was a really tough lesson. It was disturbing some of the people in the religious elite. So they were firing more and more questions at them. And then comes this question, which is not really an adversarial question. It is a good and honest question, a question that any one of us might have asked. You see, within Jewish culture at that time, there were not 10, but 613 commandments that were meant to be kept. So with that many commandments, how could you possibly keep them all? So by asking a question like this, if you could prioritize them, you might have a better shot at actually fulfilling the law. This question then is, is one of first principles or, or priorities. Which commandment is the greatest? How do we start in living a good and godly life? And that was the nature of the question. Jesus' answer comes straight out of Deuteronomy 6. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. The God, God is one. That is straight out of good Orthodox Jewish teaching. But before he finishes laying it out there, he comes in with the second. He's only asked for what the most important was. But he comes in with the second and he adds, and love your neighbor as yourself. The scribe's reply, I think, is wonderful. He says, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. To love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbors as oneself, this is much more important than a whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Remember all the way back at the beginning of Mark, Jesus' mission statement as he begins his earthly ministry begins this way. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And as the time draws shorter by the moment as he heads to the cross, there are many more of these kingdom moments that start to emerge. And this causes no small kerfuffle within the leadership, the scribes in part, because Jesus takes a lot of delight, I think, in, in pointing out where they have their priorities out of whack. They ask him the question about the Messiah, there's this question about the Messiah being the son of David, and he gives this wonderful conversation about that, and people listen to him with delight, and you can almost see them start to froth at the fact that they like what Jesus is talking about. And then he points out how goofed up their priorities really are, and this is something as pastors that we have to be very careful of because he says you wear these long flowing robes and you say long prayers and I sit in the places of honor in the synagogue in the church so why am I preaching on this lesson you can get a little nervous at this it's not so much that they wore long robes or said long prayers but they devoured widows homes they did not do what they were called to do. Their priorities were out of whack. How does all this work with this widow that was giving her offering? 
Yes, this is a stewardship lesson, as is all of Scripture, but this is one based on priorities. The nature of her gift was not the point. What was the point was her complete and utter trust in the fact that God provides. And then when we trust in that and have our priorities straight, even the poorest of the widows can give all she has to live on and live a full life. So what does this kingdom life look like where widows can give all they have and yet be assured that they will be taken care of? Because this is what the kingdom of God is. To go back to the question of the scribe, we are to love God first and then our neighbor as ourselves. When we have that order correctly, we do things and people are cared for and we have the full and abundant life that Jesus wants for us. But we get this goofed up all the time. We are well intentioned about it, but we do, we goof this up. Most of us don't commit murder, right? We're pretty good about that. Okay, just checking. Um, But how many of us love our neighbor as God intends? That can be tricky. We put things out of order. Sometimes we put ourselves in the first order. Sometimes we put other causes in the first place. And that goofs up the order of things. When I was on my internship, I was sitting across from Pastor Randy and we were talking about priorities in life. And Randy was my internship supervisor before I was a full-fledged pastor. And I was kind of talking to him about some of the lessons I've learned in my family as a, as a pastor's kid. And I said, you know, I'm going to always put my family first and then God, and then, and then Randy went, no, 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 no. And I had kind of goofed up. I meant to say church, but I, I put God there and said, and when we confuse God and church, that can be a problem as well. And what he said to me was, God first, then family, then your career. When you put it in that order, things flow the way they're supposed to be. It allows us to love the neighbor as God intends. As Jesus heads to the cross, he's laying out what is most important. He's saying we need to have our priorities straight. The widow doesn't have to worry about putting in her two last coins into the treasury when she knows that those who are around her will care for her as the law dictates. But we don't always do this. We don't always use our resources, our time, and our talents for the sake of our neighbor. Because what about us? Don't we have to look out for number one? Isn't our career, our things that we think are important, the most important? There's a story of two old paddle boats. The kind that used to go up and down the Mississippi River. And they were coming down from Memphis, uh, down towards uh, New Orleans. And they were traveling side by side. And as sailors are wont to do, one vessel made a few remarks about the snail's pace of another vessel. And words were exchanged and challenges were made. And a race began. The competition became vicious. And as the two boats roared through the deep south, one boat started to fall behind a little bit because it didn't have enough fuel. Oh, there had been plenty of fuel for the trip, but not enough fuel for a race. And as the boat dropped back, an enterprising young sailor took some of the ship's cargo and tossed it into the, the boiler ovens. And when the sailors saw that the supplies burned as well as the coal, they fueled their boat with the material that they had been assigned to transport. They wound up winning the race, but they burned their entire cargo. God has entrusted each of us with cargo. Whether that be children, spouses, friends, our job, what have you. And our job then is in part to see that that cargo reaches its destination. Yet when the program takes priority over people, people suffer. When we get our priorities out of whack, people are the ones that pay the price. So how much cargo do we sacrifice in order to achieve the number one slot? How many people never reach the destination because of the aggressiveness of a competitive captain? You see, it's all about priorities. The religious elite in Jesus' day and many of the common folks were looking for a Messiah who would come in and kick some backside and take names to overthrow the oppressive foreign government, to come running out of the tunnel with a big old foam finger chanting, we're number one, we're number one. But Jesus is not that kind of Messiah and never will be. When challenged with questions about which commandment is the greatest, Jesus presented an answer to which all the other commandments would point. The love of God followed by the love of others. 
In a world where righteous hatred and blind prejudice seem to run rampant, this is a word of love, and it is truly gospel. It is good news of the best kind. The kingdom of God draws near when we love as Jesus loved, when we act on that love not out of compulsion, but out of generosity, as the widow at the end of the story proved. As Christians, we see the love of God in action when we see what Christ has done for us. This love is one that would lead him to a cross to die as a common criminal for you and for me. Jesus then calls those who follow him, those for whom he died, to deny themselves as well, to take up their crosses and follow. And no, it isn't easy. But it is the way to the kingdom of God. Finally, if you don't think you have anything to offer, remember, we are still talking about a widow, a person of no status, no elite nature, that put in two small coins that were worth a penny into the church plate nearly 2,000 years ago. You see, in the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as insignificant service. When we place God first and love our neighbor as ourselves, we can change the whole world, even with the smallest of offerings, given out of great love. Amen.